we are here to bring you everything and anything surrounding Porsche. I'm Mike. I'm Aaron. And this is P-Car Talk. Well, we're going to do a little different. Um, a couple, you know, we were just talking about cars, and uh, we're going to do that on every episode, you know, moving forward. But we're just going to change it up a little bit. And we came up some, with some ideas. And what we're going to do is like kind of a builder series where we're talking about uh, guys that are out there building Porsches or modifying Porsches at, in, in the current market and our thoughts behind that and what we think about their cars and what they're building and things like that. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first and foremost, one of the one, one guys that we love so much, uh, Singer. How do you feel about Singer, Aaron? Uh, that's the tip top. I mean, <laughs> Rob and those guys are a good group, and we got to uh, see the launch of the DLS this year. Oh, love that uh, car. Car week, and they had a little party for that. It was with Michelin, and there was some good food there, good people. Yeah, pretty jealous you guys got to go I to that. That was a pretty awesome event, huh? all about who you know <laughs> and uh they got to see they had this the uh, engine out on the on a stand out next to the pool where the car was being presented and rob gave a nice speech and, and everything about it and got to go walk around it for the first time that is a, just a, it is artwork it yeah really is. it sure is i saw it at ren sport and you're absolutely right i mean you're he's he's being under describing the thing i mean it is it's jewelry it's what it is i mean there's no other way to it's the pinnacle. Like you said, it, it doesn't really get any better than that. And like, I mean, you got the blend of old and new and it's just, oof. I mean, when you have F1 racing teams developing your motors, eh, that's, yeah, it's a pretty good collaboration there, huh? It is. I mean, like when you were talking about building motors last episode, I mean, that's who I'd want doing my stuff. I mean, the Williams team's no joke. Yeah, absolutely. Only if, right. We got to win the lotto to make that happen, man. Those cars are some special, special animals. So, uh, for you that don't know out there that uh, I said use like I'm uh, from New York or something, you say that as use out there. But uh, for you all that do not know, Singer is out in the West Coast. And uh, what they do is take a 964 chassis platform and they build a reimagined car as they seem fit in their, in their eyes of like what a new, a new air-cooled car would be if Porsche were to do it and through their own eyes. Kind of ironic how we talked about a 993 turbo being built by Porsche last episode, but this is kind of like the more of the old school mantra, you know, they make the car a little bit wider, you know, they spruce up the engine a ton, giving it, I think it's what, 500 horsepower? Yeah, it was definitely, they use uh, uh, Cosworth, I, I believe was building their engines for a long time. I don't think they're, I don't know if they're still using yeah. it or not, but, um, but yeah, I mean, they take every bit and part that is the best the absolute best that you would use for your car yeah and everything's bespoke on that car too right everything is touched there's nothing really untouched on that vehicle um everything is massaged um you know there's no super blueprint of okay i'm just gonna pull this off the shelf and use that now don't get me wrong they use some third-party stuff you know like with headlighting and things like that but they're specifically made for them that just because they're not making them um, it's still proprietary towards them. They have deals with them. Like they have a deal with BBS to make the Fuchs they make. And they're exclusive for Singer. I mean, everything about that car is just top notch. And I think, um, I don't know the current numbers that are popped out, but I know when we were at Rensport, they had just pumped out Singer 100 because that car was there too. And I think that car was bought or had built Trussell Motorsports in Alabama, bought that car. Um, I want to say the owner of that. that yeah, place the that Alabama owns, yeah. build, yeah. And I think they, from from what I heard, I think they had another hundred on order. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, yeah, that's 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 the numbers that I was. When we're talking Pretty incredible. About and um, while we're on Singer, you know, like we'll be on that topic for a little while. But one of the topics I want to talk about is since they're using a nine six four chassis, you know, I always hear. In certain circles, people are always talking about, oh, you know, they're depleting the 964 population. They're doing this. They're doing that. I mean, we just talked about it, guys. They built 100 cars. They got maybe 100 on deck. They are not depleting the population. Now, have they brought attention to that model? I would say absolutely. Because people are maybe trying to make their own Singer S type of cars. I think they. I've seen a couple, I don't want to, you know, 
belittle them and call them knockoff singers, but maybe reimagined in their own mind, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's some guys in the UK doing it, and it's a little less costly than the singer is, but I mean, you get what you pay for at that level. I really think Rob and, and the team have worked out every detail in the car. There were some things that I didn't know about the car that there's different yeah. bumper pieces that look like they're plated nickel and they're not. Absolutely. And, and, and things like that. But I mean, when you have quilted leather <laughs> and the engine bay and you have that and it just, it, everything flows and you, and you could pick out your own details, but everything looks purposeful, functional. And it just is a, it's just a great look on the car. I, I don't think it gets any better than, than what they put together. No. I don't know where and how, how that. awesome is that those, uh, the quarter mirrors with the air and let it goes back to the engine. That's super race car stuff right there. Carbon fiber too. So yeah. Like as it should be. Race yeah. Car. Unbelievable car. Yeah, absolutely. And, but I, I do think that them as a whole and other builders that maybe pick that platform to build on, um, ha- the 964 used to kind of be a stepchild. Nobody really wanted that car, right? I did. It wasn't the, like the teens, and I guess lower than that for, for a lot of the cost for the car. And I, I've i always liked that body style. I think it looks the cleanest, but yeah, it is like they've deemed it the, the best of the air cools to start with as a platform. Yeah. And I mean, there's a reason for that. I mean, I don't know if they did it because it was so cheap when they first originally, because Singer isn't like a fly-by-night operation they've they've done a lot of r&d before they actually started pumping out cars you know he was working on his own car for a very very long time before he decided to say okay you know maybe let's let's make this a deal let's make this a thing um but i definitely think it's brought interest to the 964 brand um they weren't inspiring me to get the 964 uh but i'm glad i have a 964 and there's popularity because of that um i was lucky to get in before the bubble went too crazy uh, with a 964, I, di- I still did pay up. I didn't get one for the teens, but, you know, I did still pay for mine. When I was looking at them in 2012 and I just got to Germany, the guards red on black interior, C2, just like yours. I was seeing it with decent miles. I don't remember the mileage offhand, but I think it was 25. Oh, man, I wish I could have paid 25 for my car. And I was like, well, I don't know. That seems a little expensive for a 964. Even though, I mean, it was really clean. Yeah. And looking back on it, obviously, hindsight, 2020, eh, it's... Yeah. Uh, I got a water cold. I'll live with it for now. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get, Maybe the I'll market get will the, cool uh, some more on the 964. I'll get but yeah, one. like for me, my, like I think what me uh, well, on the 964 what really blended the generations for me because, I mean, I love them all. Like, I, I mean, I, I, I love the early long hood cars. Here. Like there's there's nothing that I don't like about them. I like the G body cars. Like they all have their own unique characteristics. What I that which I love about them. But I feel which really blended me, and I'm probably gonna get burned at the stake on this one. But you know the 993, and I think Aaron and I have a lot of common feelings about the 993. Like we we feel like that car is less air cooled than any of the other cars. Like you know people give the 996 a hard time, and I feel like. The 993 and the 996 share a lot of more things in common than a 996 and a 964. Um, and I know that the 964 was a gap year car, and I'm just talking like I'm biased because I own one, but at the end of the day, it's, it is more classic Porsche. There is no denying that. It has the torpedo headlights. You know, it, it is more classic Porsche, regardless if people want to call it a stepchild or it was a gap year car, and, you know, they were just building that car so they could build a 993 and change everything up. and um, but there was a lot of components on the 964 that have that were changed when people say it's just a gap year car and you know like Porsche was struggling during that time you know they were they were battling potential bankruptcy at that time um so you know it's an interesting car and for me it was the best of both worlds i felt like it was as modern as i ever wanted a air cooled car to be but it looked like an early long hood car could look like even being a short hood car. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I mean, the lines and the 964 to me are better than in the 993. I think the 993 to me feels a little bit more compartmentalized in the way that they, they draw out the, the fender lines are done. And then, I don't know, there's just something about that. I mean, obviously it's a 911, so that shape hasn't changed mm-hmm. too much. 
Yeah. Um, but I mean, between the two, if I had to pick, and it's nine six four all day long. Yeah, I agree. And like, and and in other circles, you know, guys that are a Porsche f- aficionados, like I mean, just recently, um, Spike Ferriston, you know, mentioned something to that effect. You know, hey, what would you pick a nine nine three or a nine six four? And he admittedly said, hey, three or four years ago, I'd have said nine nine three all day with a knee jerk reaction. And I feel like a lot of the Porsche aficionados and have been around a long time have just kind of been brainwashed with, oh, 993 was the last car. You know, that's the way to go. But I mean, he even said, I mean, literally this week, oh, I'd much rather the, the a 964, the way it feels, the way it drives. He even said being inside a 993, it feels more bubbly. There's more cabin room. He just, you know, that's kind of where almost the, maybe the beginning of the GT car feel yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Maybe that's where they started going for, for less of the race heritage, at least for those cars, and knowing that they were going to produce the RSs and, and go into a GT market once it hit the 96s. Yeah, yeah, and and that's why I picked the car, you know, and that's my special blend of old and new. That's why it's like it still looks old, but, you know, it, it does a little everything that I needed to do. And it being so hot here in Tampa, you know, I... It has AC in it, you know, so that's uh, it. I, yeah, it's, it does, but you ride in that, and it's it's still pretty, yeah. pretty hot. AC is kind of a loose term in that car, but, I mean, it's kind of still kind of damp air being blown at you, but I guess it's better than nothing, you know? Maybe if you start it, like what I do is I try to start it in the garage and let the AC run, and maybe if it gets the cabin cool, it kind of keeps it cool. <laughs> One of those reasons that the, uh, the water-cold life is not too bad. Absolutely, and I'm I'm looking forward to joining that here hopefully in the next year. But um, back to Singer, you know, like they've their R and D what they did over the years, and I mean, like I said, everything they do is proprietary. You know, as far as like even if they if they third party something out, it's exclusive to them, and you know they pay the big bucks, and that's why the price tag is the big bucks too. You know, like I mean that it's a hefty hefty price on that car. You know. Yeah, it does. I mean, it does range. It's I think it's about it's half a million. I think for the cars, and, and I think that's back and forth. I think the option, like anything else, option wise, I I think it. I don't think it really goes much higher than that. I mean, and I, I know the DLS is a totally different animal. I think that's one point eight. Yeah, and I don't know if that's MSRP. If it's not, if there's not not a markup on that because limited limited production. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even, I was looking it up earlier. I don't even remember, recall the numbers of how many they're going to make of those DLSs, but I know it's very, very low numbers on them. Like, I th- I want to say it's limited to like maybe 30. I don't know why 30 that's, sounds right. so, yeah. that's kind of sticking in my head for some reason. So, and, and for what I've heard, you know, and I, there's no factual statement on this from what I've heard, that they're all sold. Yep. Man, so, that is, that's, that's what I heard. I mean, think well. about that. You know, that sounds like a ridiculous number, but it, I mean, there's 30 guys out there that have the money that obviously think that that car's worth it. So, and well, I mean, the only other side is how long are these Porsches that aren't pure what they were? I mean, are, are they going to last? How long are they going to hold those numbers? Good point. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because I was wondering that myself. You know, and like, and and everybody knows, so it's not a secret. You know, we can use their names like Jerry Seinfeld and Spike Ferriston and Paul Zuckerman and these guys. You know, they're they're Porsche files, you know, they're in it deep and they've got the bank accounts to support the hobby. And, um, a lot of those guys like that, their stuff pretty stock, you know what I mean? Like maybe a little bit of changing here and there, but they like the way it left from the, from the factory. And if he, you know, I've heard Jerry say and other, you know, places where he's spoke before, you know, on Spike Ferriston's thing and you know, a rare 930 may come up for sale with hardly any miles in a PTS color or something like that. And, you know, they want some outlandish money for it, maybe three, four hundred thousand dollars. And and Jerry's like, I would never pay that for that car. That car's not worth that kind of money. And he has all the money in the world. So what's that saying? Like, even though he thinks it's a beautiful car, he's not gonna pay that kind of money for that car. Now, he has paid big money for cars before. That's not a thing, but I guess it's all depends on what you value at, right? Like what you think the car is going to be valued at. Yep, it's all it, it's it's all subjective then to what you're collecting and and that sort of thing. I think well, I think Jerry's kind of at the point where he's got everything he wants, and then what he wants is absolutely unbelievably rare. Yeah, and it's just you know the 
he's at the top of the food chain. Obviously, everybody knows that. That's no secret. Um, and he's he's pretty much probably had everything he's had ever wanted from the Porsche standpoint. You know, as far as those cars go, like, I mean, if he wanted, you know, he wanted a nine seventeen. I mean, okay, you, you can afford it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It happens. But um, you know, with these rare cars, you know, it's a good point. You like, you wonder. 20, 30, 40 years from now, you know, the next generations coming up, are they going to appreciate a singer build as much as actual current populations appreciating a singer build? I don't know. I guess time will tell. You know what I mean? I, it's hard to say. I mean, something that costs that kind of money, it'd be hard at, for it to depreciate, I would think, to peanuts. I mean, Look yeah. at co- look at coach builders out there like Penaferina cars or Zagato cars, you know, that they, they were, you know, the ones that are built, you know, in those kind of low numbers, 30 cars, 20 cars, like those cars still seem to carry high value, you know. That's true. I mean, it's it's, it's they're as valuable as the brand is valuable. That's that's where it's at with those Yeah, cars. that's a good point. And I think it speaks at the end of the day as time I think that the biggest thing with those things will be time. Because the craftsmanship is there, right? So, like, everything is so well put together. Everything is so solid. You know, there may be a day where, you know, when we're dead and gone, somebody's going to close that door on that Singer Porsche and be like, look, man, this is how they used to build things back in the day. This is a bespoke car. This isn't even factory, and this is how they built stuff, you know? Yeah, their level of detail was even higher than it came from from the factory. Absolutely. And everything they did, they did. Yeah, like their quality control, everything. Like the car doesn't leave unless it's perfect. Everything's perfect, right? So, and I think we saw one, well, we've seen many of them. We, um, But I think one of the first ones I ever saw in person was, I think, Works last year. There was a couple of them there. And they were just parked in the basement, you know, next to like the Lancia race cars and stuff like that. And, man, they were gorgeous. A lot of hidden gems in that parking garage. yeah. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother episode. But yeah, I mean, Singer as a whole, you know, I I would say is like a pinnacle build, you know, like if you have, if you have Sultan money or maybe dot com money or, you know, something like that, maybe you're not going to get the DLS, you know, because those are spoken for, but you're still going to have to wait in line and pretty penny, you know, I mean, I think their build time is like a year and a half, maybe, once you get on the list. Like any normal restoration. Yeah. Anyways. I mean, they're I mean, building a car from scratch. Exactly. I mean, and that's fair, you know and I mean? And, and I would say even freaking a year and a half is still pretty fast, you know? Like, yep. So, For sure. you know, they got a pretty healthy waiting list. They're doing pretty good out there in California. They're, they're pretty well known. And, you know, there's no, there's no shortcomings if you get one of those cars. Not at all. I mean, I, I wonder if there's, I mean, there's definitely people that are trying to, to replicate that same thing, but what if somebody does the same thing with a 993? Yeah. Or or any of the other marks, I mean, and just goes and says, this is the best, the best that you can build with well, that. that well, it's funny you bring that up because I don't want to really talk about them at the minute because I don't really have them on our schedule, but we can we can explore that for one second. The 993, what is that? The, the Gunther Works car, oh, right? Oh, yeah, that's true. The all-carbon car. So they they're kind of doing that. And uh, I think their cars are what five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars, something like they that. Maybe and it's it's justified because of what seniors getting for their yeah. cars that they're going to be at that same level. Yeah, they want to compete, you know. Exactly. So like they're they're in the bespoke market and they're competing, you know, with those bespoke type of cars. So that makes sense for those cars to be at that level. Um, I just can't imagine. Like I know we talked price a lot earlier. We talked about that one eighty five. How we had sticker shock. I mean, I know these players that are buying these kind of cars are in a different era you know or in a different type of level than us um by far but uh i can't imagine what that must be like to go in there and say hey uh i want to spec this out and this is what i want to do and you know when you you throw down the five hundred thousand dollars for your bespoke you know reimagined by singer i I can't even imagine what that must be like well it's great because you're you're i mean you're at the point where it's it's yours nobody else is going to have yeah car ever you're never going to see another one and that's where that I think that's where that might hold the values of the singers, not just build quality, but yeah, the bespokeness of that car. Is that car, there's not one like it, even though there's two hundred. And another testament of why they're so special, and, and I'm believe me, I am on every car website looking at car prices on a regular basis, just part of, I'm sure, any normal guy's routine. 
when you're looking at cars, that's like our stuff. We want to see where the prices are at, especially for the cars you're interested in exactly. and where they're at. And I'll t- I can I tell you this once, not that I've ever looked, but I'm sure it would have come up in some of my feeds if there was one ever for sale. I have never seen a singer for sale secondhand. So I wonder, I, I don't, I wonder if that's kind of like some of the other brands where they don't normally come up for yeah. secondhand sale where it might go back to, go back through Singer to yeah. be It may do that. Sold, or, or it could just trade hands without even being advertised, exactly. you know, because they are so special. Or the, on the other side of that, everyone's keeping them. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking too, you know, to play devil's advocate on that same question. I was thinking like, maybe they're so special and they are so great, which I believe even though I've never been in one, that how you waited so long to get one, right? Everything on it is custom. Why would you, why would you sell it unless you were maybe desperate for money at that point? I don't know. But to have something that precious, you know, like, you know, right now, maybe like you're one of 110, you know, like if he's come out with 10 since the last 100, you know, or I don't know how many have come out since then. Still low number production. Oh, yeah, it's ridiculously low, right? So, yeah, I mean, that's interesting on its own. But uh, let's transition a little bit and um, take a little bit of a break. All right, we're back from break. Uh, Aaron and I had to go grab a beer. Uh, cheers, or we should say prost. 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 So uh, we're back, uh, ha- sipping a brewski, because we're after hours. Like I said, we're nine to fivers, so we got to come in here and uh, do our thing and give you content and uh, talk shop. So uh, the next guy we want to discuss, uh, Rod Emery. How much do we love Rod? Uh, he's a pretty cool guy. Yeah, he's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I'm. Um, I mean, he's doing. You know, his family's been doing the restoration business way longer than Singer ever thought about doing it. I mean, that's uh, that's just. I guess that brings more brand less brand loyalty. I mean, if that that could tell you what the future of Singer is going to look like right there. Yeah, because, absolutely. I mean, Emory's still doing it. There's still a wait list. There's still. Years to build the cars. Yeah. They're still just doing 356s. Uh-huh. And it's been perfected for a while as far as what they, how they do them. And yeah, he is the 356 guy, huh? Like, I I know when we went to uh, Works last year, we saw his Gamoon build that was there and the Le Mans racer winner. And his attention to detail and able to document and prove that car was what it was, is it was insane. Like, his... You know, like some people would have given up. Like he had to go through books and find stuff and pictures and all this stuff. I think a little bit of that was a credit to uh, to to Seinfeld there. Yeah, Jerry Jerry helped him out, or at least messed with him from from how the he, story, did. he was I, telling the story. Yeah, the story for you guys that don't know out there, he got a random text message one day, and it was from Jerry because Jerry has obviously everything, but he has a special book that has all the blueprints for that car for whatever reason. And um, he was, when I say he, I'm talking about Rod Emery, was for the life of him trying to get some blueprints to figure out where, you know, where to start with this thing, what to do. And and I think uh, they were at the Malibu Kitchen, and I say they, I'm talking about Spike Ferriston and Jerry Seinfeld. I think they were messing with Rod because they're all friends. So then they had, they had his number, so they started texting him. And and I from the story, from what I heard, like Rod Emery's like, who who is this and what? What is this? Where, where did you get this information? I need this. Like, and he's like, I have the book. You can cu- you can use it. And then finally identified himself. He's like, of course you have this book. Yep. I mean, that had to be fun for them, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of neat. Those guys kind of razz each other, kind of like we do on a different level. You know, it's like, you know, there's still guys at the end of the day, which is kind of awesome, you know. Like, they're not, you know, all too pretentious and not, you know, too good to, like, you know, poke fun with each other. But, um Back to Rod, you know, like, I'm I'm kind of, like, romanticized about, like, you know, how he kind of grew up. Like, his dad was a Porsche guy. Like, he built his first Porsche. Oh, God. I'm just talking over myself. His first Porsche when he was, I think, 16 years old or even younger. He built that 356 to go road racing in California. I think he was 14 when he started yeah. building, if I, if I remember. Yeah, right I think it's like, it's like that navy blue, and it's got, like, Sunoco yeah, lettering and something like that on it. Guitar. Yeah, cool car, right? And, like, there's pictures of Rod at his dad's old place, you know, where his dad owned that 356 stuff where he used to work on all that stuff, you know, like him inside the the glass box in front, you know, like digging for parts and all that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, I, I'm not going to lie, you know, me being so passionate about Porsche, I wish I had a history like that, you know. You know, maybe not necessarily in car building, but 
you know, my dad didn't have a cool Porsche or a cool car or anything like that. He was just an average Joe, you know, had a normal car and like, I didn't come from those kind of roots. So it's kind of like romantic that, you know, that he has that history and he's still in it and he still loves it. So it says a lot about him as a person that he's still passionate about it and he's not burned out, you know, he's, he still loves every day. You know, we've talked to him a couple of times at events and he loves going to work every day. Who wasn't doing what he does and being having those abilities, but it's definitely cool to see it being passed down generation to generation and continuing it on. Yep. I mean, the same thing. My dad had some cool cars, but yeah. none of them were a P car. So. Yeah, exactly. And it and it's interesting, you know, like as successful as Rod has been, you know, he's a pretty humble guy. I don't know if any of you guys have ever met him out there, but you know, like I said, we've met him several occasions. Like, and when he recognizes you and he's met you more than once, like he has a conversation with you, you know, like about what's happening or what's current and, you know, he isn't too big for the moment, I guess. And which is amazing because he is a big guy, like as far as like, not like I'm talking about in stature, but as far as popularity goes, um, he is an important figure in the Porsche community. Yeah, I think, but I think a lot of the Porsche community is that way. They just want to talk about what they're into. And if you're into Porsche stuff, that's, that's just wants to talk like we do. Yeah. Shop. That's, that's how it goes. Great point. You know, and, um, He's doing a wicked build right now. He's doing like a, a 964 chassis under a 356 with a twin turbo setup. And it's like a wide body 356. I think we saw it at uh, Ren Sport this year. And I think that car is going to be, be done sometime soon. And it's going to be something, you know, it's what first of its kind ever done. I mean, he actually widened the body like through the center. Like he didn't put fender flares on it. Like he actually severed the car in half and widened the car through the middle. And I mean, just the engineering behind that, I'm not an engineer by trade. I do finance, but like unbelievable, like the engineering and the spot on stuff he must have to do for that. It's just, it's unreal. I saw that car, but I guess I didn't as detailed as I am. I, I, I looked at it, saw it and I was like, that's pretty cool. And I, I didn't know the backstory of that at all. So yeah. that's, that's a pretty crazy build. Yeah. Pretty wild, huh? And I know like, that they, I know they said, or I know that he brought it out there unfinished. Yeah. Technically, but it's still cool that he brought it out. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's, it's pretty close when he brought it out to Ren Sport, you know, and, and he, and I talked to him for about 10 or 15 minutes about the car when I was out there and he's still just as excited about it. You know, you would think a guy that's been building cars all his life would be like, yeah, you know, it's cool. You know, it's, you know, it's what the customer wants, you know, like, no, but he was passionate about it, you know, which is, which I just love. He just exudes that passion and it's kind of infectious, you know, like everyone around him kind of is that way. Like his staff is amazing. Like everybody he works with is passionate and, it's just pretty, he's a, he's an amazing guy, amazing builder, you know, like love that he's down to earth, love that he's approachable, you know, like, and I don't have a 356, but maybe someday in my life, you know, I would love to own a 356. No way could I ever afford to own one of his 356s he's ever touched, but what an amazing builder, huh? Yeah, that's for sure. He does make you want the 356. That's, that's not something I've really desired i mean those cars just never really appealed that much but the way that he's built them in the original outlaw stature that's those cars do look cool and they really bring you to that absolutely to that style or that side of the house yeah i mean if you were gonna if you were gonna ever get a 356 you you'd almost like if you didn't know anything about a 356 you know for example just take someone off the street and you say hey and you pull them in and rod emery had built that car they don't know who Rod Emery is, but you look at that car and they're like, wow, that's a slick looking car. What is it? And you're like, well, it's a Porsche 356. And you're like, wow, I've, not, I've never seen anything like that before. It's because, you know, it's still a 356, but it's just massaged in the right ways where it's just, mm, so it's good. Back to the same formula of what, what they see as perfection in, in that style and that model of car. Yeah. And I recently just finished uh, a, a car of his that he finished. I saw an article. I want to say I want to say it was a month or two ago. It wasn't that long ago, and uh, it was John Oates, you know, of Holland Oates. Yep. He built him a three fifty six, and uh, I kind of watched a little bit of info on and read a little bit of info on it. And um, John Oates speaks about the car, you know, and how long it took and how involved he was with the build. And that's another thing I love about it, like. All of Rod's customers are very involved in the build, whether they want to be or not, because Rod makes them be involved. He's like, look, 
I'm, I'm building your car. This isn't my car. You need to get in here. You need to tell me what you want. And then like Rod gives him feedback, which is great. You know, it's a partnership, you know, like he's the craftsman, he's building the car, but he's also working with the customer. He's like, you know, if something's like in left field, he's going to tell him, Hey, you know, tactfully, you know, that's not going to work, man. Like, you know, we're not, gonna, we're not going to put a nitrous bottle on your 356, you know? In theory, <laughs> that sounds great, but let's steer you over here. Here, I think this would better fit your needs. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, it's a that's that's cool that he's willing to to go through the details, make it your car, or get you involved in it, where you'll really love it to the level that he does building it. Yeah. And another thing I love about like Rod, and I'm not saying he does this because I don't know his entire blueprint history, and I'm not saying he's never done this, but a lot of the cars that he's building that I do know from the ones that I have seen are are basket cases when he gets them. You know, so it's not like for purists that are out there in the in the Porsche worlds that follow us, you know, he's not bastardizing some like pristine example that's been like bone stock forever, has original paint, original interior, everything's original in the car, has just been maintained perfectly for 50 years, and then he goes in there and hacks it up. That's not what he's doing at all. What he's doing is finding these these barn finds, if you will, like I know that's a term everybody uses, uh, everything is a stinking barn find, but... Literally, like something that's a rust bucket, and he's building it, and he's like, okay, well, I mean, it's gone. I have to put all this new metal in it anyways. Why don't we make it my my imagination or what the customer's imagination is? So, you know, I mean, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like he's doing justice to that, or do you feel that, you know, he's doing something wrong by building what he's building? I think he's doing... I think he's doing everything right because he's saving those cars that you think Absolutely. are un- unsavable at that point. And, and not only is he just, he's not bringing them back to what they would have been period correct, but he's bringing them into that vision of everything that customer could ever uh, expect out of the car there and, and bringing their dream and their passion to life. I couldn't agree with you more. Like it makes total sense. Like, If you're at the beginning anyways, essentially, if you're going to start at the blueprint, why not put your flavor on it, right? So what he's doing is awesome. Love it. Love every bit of it. And and he's proving that also with the Gamoon car, rewinding back a little bit like what we started with on, on this segment, he can do a bone stock car because that car left the left and you know, the way it left on the lawn, he built it just like that. Even with the whole like stuffed rag under the fog light. I don't know if you guys know that out there, but he he studied so, you know, judiciously, like looking at these photos, he noticed that the light was off in those pictures and what the the guys did at the quick fix at the track because they needed the beam up and not pointing down at the ground, they just stuffed a rag under the light. So he even restored it to that degree where he stuffed a rag under the light identical to the way it was when it raced at Le Mans. That's pretty intense. Well, I mean, that speaks to the heritage of that car. I mean, you would want every detail done, and that's but that's really cool. But, yeah, and it goes back to his level of detail, and he's the guy, right? Like, th- nothing goes unturned. Like, he can do the, the wild build that we just talked about, like the twin-turbo wide-body 356 that no one's ever seen in their life that he's making to the Le Mans winning racer, Gamoon car, you know, I think it's number 49, I think the car is. Uh, if I'm wrong, correct me in the comments on Instagram. I think it's 46. 46. Yeah, I think it's on our Instagram. Is it? It is on the Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Is it 46? Okay. Um, we'll take Aaron's word for it. If it's wrong, go ahead and post and tell us if we're wrong. But either way, we saw the car in person. Amazing car. Amazing guy. Again, we've met him at multiple events. Um, another thing about him which is pretty interesting, a lot of people don't know, is that he gets in every morning before his staff gets in and basically works by himself for a couple hours. I mean, he gets in the shop at like 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. That's not like waking up. He's there like working at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. And the reason why he does that is he just likes that. That's how, that's how intense the guy is about his passion. He likes being in the workshop. He likes grinding it out. He likes the wrenches. He loves being around the cars. Like, he doesn't want to do all that other, I guess, office stuff. You know, he doesn't want to do the HR stuff. He doesn't want to have to mess with, you know, the management stuff. Like, he loves building the cars. And, like, he was telling me that's part of, like, what 
makes him, you know, love what he does because he, he's doing that to get in there early so he can get ahead of the project. You know, it's almost kind of just saying like his initiative is so strong. It's, it's pretty amazing. He's a pretty amazing guy. But, um, to talk about it, like to compare the two, you know, not that this is a builder, you know, build off or anything between the two totally different cars, but both have incredible attention to detail, right? Yeah, it'd be cool to see them swap builds, have Singer build a 356 and have Rod build a 964 and see what, I mean, they both have that, that quality and that detail. How would they, how would each other do that? And then what would they add or take away that the other's doing now? And that type of thing. I mean, that would take, yeah, that I'm sure would. it takes years of development, but yeah, it would be interesting to see them like do crap. Or at least talk about it or at yeah. least draw a whiteboard it out. Okay. Here's what I would do this, this, and this, and see actually how, what the outcome of the, that is. But again, I mean, we're only talking about two different Porsche models, 356 and the 964. Yeah. There's still several in between all those that, that Absolutely. nobody's, I mean, Gunther works, but that's, yeah. To me, if it's a full carbon fiber body, it's not exactly the same thing that Singer's doing. With exactly. The, with the air cooled 911 side. Yeah. So, what else could you improve, or what model could you go after that, that nobody's doing things for? Yeah. Or just like, yeah, like you said, a collabo builder, or like even like maybe just share ideas, or it'd be an interesting exercise, nonetheless. The ultimate of whatever yeah. for each car. Yeah, it would be interesting, you know, because Rod seems pretty, you know, open to ideas. You know, like I, a, a, you know, pretty workable guy. So, like, it, that would be an interesting exercise to see what the two of them could come up with, on, you know, together. Hey, throwing it out there, if you guys end up doing it, uh, credit comes this way. So, exactly. You R- heard, R&R yeah, you, or an RS. Yeah, you, you, you heard it here first. Uh, collabo uh, between okay. Singer and uh, Rod Emery. Um, maybe it'll happen someday. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I bet they're both pretty busy doing what they're doing, but uh, so they're probably never going to have yeah. any time to really do any of that stuff. I'm but, sure. uh, it would be interesting nonetheless. But um, one more interesting fact about Rod Emery, this is how much, you know, I, I mean, I guess trust, I guess, is where I'm going with this, is that, you know, everybody knows who Magnus Walker is, um, Porsche Rob Zombie. Um, he took his, like, 964 um, front quarter panels, you know, or front panels to get louvered at Rod Emery's place because it's on that, very strange like curvature on that headlight bucket and he trusted rod emery to do that and rod emery knocked it out of the park so i mean what's that saying like he's never even done it before and he did it yeah well i mean but that's that style of metal work he's doing everything by hand anyway was anyways with those 356s so i mean as long as it's hot rod shop style stuff that's where you would go for louvers and then being the porsche guy rod is and that's the obvious choice or at least in my yeah. opinion, that's who that's who I would go to. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with that. But I mean, that's saying that's saying a lot too, because Magnus is pretty pretty particular about his cars and the fact that he's you know employing Rod to, to do that, and then Rod never doing it before, being able to just knock just it out. It, yeah. yeah, no problem. I don't need any test ones. I'll, I'll I'll work it out. You know, it's challenging, but I'll figure it out. You know, and that just shows how much experience he has. I mean, you can, I mean I'm sure you've seen there's there's no one that hasn't seen Magnus's 964 build, but if you haven't, that's definitely yeah. Look him up, it. Magnus Walker on Instagram. If you haven't, I, I'm sure if you're listening to this, there's no way you haven't heard of Magnus Walker or know what he has in his stable. But if by by the one off chance that you're maybe new to Porsche or haven't done like you got some catching up to do, go ahead and uh, look up Herban Outlaw on, on YouTube and figure out who Magnus is and. You'll see his car, and, you know, he's got a lot of custom builds. You know, he's his own outlaw, you know, like Rod Emery's a 356 outlaw. That's where that kind of came from. And, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, cached the phrase with Urban Outlaw with Magnus Walker. So, you know, I guess naturally those two would have met up on that anyhow. Yep, outlaw and outlaw. Yeah, only makes sense, right? Well, so for the Builder Series, that was great with those two Um there will be more to come. Like I said, this isn't like a, okay, Singer's number one, Rod's number two. That's none of that. We're just kind of talking about guys that we know, that we've kind of seen their work firsthand um, and just kind of want to talk about, you know, like and and where there's a little bit of background there where we can actually talk to something that we can, you know, something real for you guys to actually hear about instead of somebody like we're pulling something out of thin air and be like, oh, yeah, I've seen this guy build stuff on the Internet. His pictures look cool. Never seen the car. Never talked to the guy. We're, we, 
we probably won't talk about builders like that because not because we don't like them, but we don't have any substance for that product. Exactly. I mean, and that's from our experiences, not from anything else but that. But yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's real at that point. So, um, you know, with that being said, let's, you know, we got a little bit of time left. Let's move into some questions we actually have here. We have some interesting questions here. I got, and uh, we'll start, I'll ask Aaron and then I'll answer. But um, what is your favorite Porsche? That's a that's a pretty broad question, isn't it? It's broad, but it's it's going to be a quick answer. <laughs> what is your answer. favorite Porsche? Um, uh, one of the, the ooh, a 73 RS. Ooh. That's that's pretty much where yeah. it begins that's and sexy. ends. That's sexy. Well, let's elaborate on that then. I mean, so you went seventy three RS. Okay, let's let's spec it out. Let's hear the colors. Seventy three RS in uh, white and red. I saw one. Um, there was, there's actually I don't know if she's a grandma or not, but we can. There's an older lady that uh, at the Nurburgring Ring drives hers there. Wow. <laughs> and it's pretty phenomenal. Um, that's pretty epic. It's also in white and red. It's that's pretty red, epic. And that's where I saw it. And I was like, white and red is what I want. That's epic. It looks so good. Ugh, grandma out there ripping on the Nurburgring, Ring, huh? Not, Good for her. Yeah, that's German lady. It's, yeah, it's, it was good times. Are you in love with the grandma or the car? Ah, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit no, of both. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> just well, joking. I mean, just joking. The, <laughs> see how would I get the car? Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, you could pull like a reverse Anna Nicole Smith type of deal, yeah, right? Man. Like marry old and maybe inherit the car. I guess there's a plot behind that. <laughs> <laughs> well, my favorite car. Since we're talking about uh, Porsche, obviously, uh, 917 long tail. Okay. Oh, I didn't even think about race cars. Mm, maybe. Everything's on the table. If you want to reevaluate while I talk about this. No, I'm still going to stick. I mean, I would be great, but then I feel like I could Martini livery. Okay. Oh, killer car. That's, killer car. That's definitely the way to do it. Yeah. Sidebar on that, I think, um, I think Aaron was with me, um, and we watched a 917 scream up the road on Amelia, like, Oh yeah. When uh, was it, it was it Derek Anderson that was driving? uh, I thought it might've been Derek. I I thought it was one of the, I thought it was Derek Bell, but I, Oh, Bell, Bell. I I think it was Derek Bell. uh, We're pretty sure it was him. I don't know if he was driving it. It was the, it was the green and purple livery. Yeah. Yeah. Long story short, he was transporting the car from the works Concord but there was a long road, probably about what half a mile, maybe. Yeah, he was heading up towards uh, the towards the, the lawn to the Ritz, yeah, right? To the Ritz, yeah. So, and the road was clear, and man, he he ripped it like he was on the track, and you know, from circles that we talked to, you know, that car can idle. You gotta yeah, you gotta be on. It's it. an on and off situation. Yeah, so it's on or off, and man, we were privy enough. Like we just happened to like we didn't follow. We actually were in an Uber at the time, weren't we? Like we were moving I locations. Think we were I think waiting for an Uber, or we were walking towards the intersection. Yeah, that, something like that. We were transitioning yeah. wherever we were at, so it wasn't like a big to do. Like, no, hey, no, everybody, no. come out here. Look, no. he's moving the nine seventeen. It was like we were transitioning from locations ourselves, and like we were going to go to the Ritz, I think, to go see something, and he buzzed right by us, and that was amazing. And that makes that event that that special. I mean, going to Amelia and experiencing that side of things. I mean, Rensport is definitely the ultimate event, but if you got to go to something else, yeah, Amelia makes it. And then, I mean, Pebbles, I would probably, if I had to rate the events, I'd go Pebble above Amelia, but... They have their yeah. own little uniques, uniquenesses. And yeah, each there's their rights. nuances at each place. Um, I would say 917 long tail martini livery for me and him buzzing by in the 917 that day, just kind of like ice, yeah, yeah, icing on the cake. Done deal. Boom. Yep, that, that's why that's my favorite car. And um, yeah, that's my one. Um, let us know in the comments what you guys' favorite car is. Um, got a couple more questions here. It says... Uh, why do you think Porsche even makes SUVs? This is uh, an interesting that's, question. So Porsche can be Porsche? I mean, I think... I agree. Like everybody, I, I think a lot of people have analyzed it enough, but if they didn't have SUVs, and for a long time that's what saved them, I think that's where they really make their money. Like you were talking previously, yes, there are some pretty high prices for 911s, but I don't think that's... I think they can be. Uh-huh. 
and they can be low numbers. It doesn't matter because you have such a strong SUV market. I agree. I think it allows Porsche to be Porsche, right? Like you sell, I mean, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings because they make great SUVs, but they're selling those SUVs to families, soccer moms, mall crawlers. You want to fill in the Blake, whatever. Yeah. Vinny, Vinny Russo, we're calling you out. Um, But they make those cars so they can make the GT cars, right? They make those cars so they can do the R&D and build the special cars because it costs them money to build that sp- those special cars, and they make so few of them. You know, you only make 2,200, 23, 2,400 GT cars per year. Well, the R&D that goes into that, I'm sure, is miraculous, you know, the amount of money. So, I mean, I'm not in their, you know, accounting department, and I don't know what their checks and balances are. And I'm, not I'm sure, sure they're good. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, sure they're good. fine. But at the end of the day, I'm sure those SUVs allow them to explore. And, and maybe not even just the GT cars. Maybe, maybe where I'm reaching for and where I'm going down this road is it allows them to build like the 935, right? The new 935. Oh, that is a car. You know, like something special like that or the Club Sport GT3 or GT2 RS. Mm-hmm. Something the that is so, turn. yeah, the, something those cars that are so bespoke within their own department where they can go and take that SUV money and spend it on stuff like that. Oh, well, maybe, but I think they recoup some of that too. I mean, all those speedsters are spoken for. Oh, yeah, seven, of course, yeah. absolutely. I'm not saying that, seven, but I'm saying it allows them the freedom, I would say. Instead of being a brand, you know, you pick one off the shelf. It doesn't. It gives maybe, you a continuity in income yeah. each month just to be yeah. like, yeah, I can, I can throw some money through a few million here. Exactly, million where they can here. say, you know, hey, you know, that, that idea, there, you know, and I'm sure there's hundreds that never work out that they invest millions into that, you know, that go to the drawing board and they're like, wow, that was, uh, that was a really bad idea and we, and we wasted $10 million on it. Well, you know, they can afford to do that kind of stuff. And then that's where those little, those ideas sit in the little warehouse in Stuttgart. Exactly, right? And, and the then you see, and then you, yeah, and 20 years later, you're like, oh, hey, here's this prototype. And you're like, oh, great. I never even knew that existed. That's okay, because Seinfeld probably already owned it. Oh, yeah. I owned it, but I gave it back. Yeah, at least drove it. And he's like, yeah, I don't want it. Next question we've got here is pretty interesting. Is this one, I'm having a hard time reading. It says, What is your favorite? I don't even know what this says. It says, what is your favorite? Oh, what's your favorite thing to do with your Porsche? Uh, Drive it. I agree. Drive it. I mean, some guys like to wrench, though. So I guess maybe that kind of why that question makes a little bit of sense. I think. I mean, some guys like to build. You know, we know we know some guys that are like they're wrenches, you know, like after they're done building the car, they actually push want to kick it down the road and want to start something else. Yeah, I'm a driver. I think you're a driver too, right, Aaron? Yeah, pretty much. I, I mean, I like the fact that I can work on my 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 eleven. I feel like it's, I don't know, I, this it's it's, uh, it's still where it's it's usable and I get. I don't feel bad about putting a wrench. Like I'm not going to torque it a spack or anything like that. I mean, I'm going to do all those things. And agreed. I, I feel like when I do it, I have that sense of knowing it, it was done to the way I would expect it to be done and to the. To yeah, the, to every detail that I like it. So, yeah, I don't mind turning a wrench on. But the driving car. is definitely yeah. my the the favorite of the. Yeah, I would say, cars. and and like, and that's kind of a global th- thing to say. I like to do driving, but I think driving, driving, and and what it does for me, I guess you know what I mean. What you know, it's kind of cathartic, right? Yep. So you drive, you know, and I know it's pretty cliche to say it, but you get in the car, you don't really hear it, you know, you don't think about anything, like. Some cars are louder than others. My car sounds like a cup car, so it's it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like it's not true. It's it it, it it is cup car. Yeah. So I get a lot. Hey, is there an LS in that thing? I'm like, come on, man. Like, I I mean, uh, no, no. And they're like, how does the three six sound like that? Anyways, the point is, I get in that car and I don't think about anything. Sounds great. Smells great. I'm watching the tack. And I know it's been said a thousand times before, so if you don't have a Porsche, I'm trying to describe it to you. Like, There's nothing better in the world than to get in that car, especially if you're passionate about Porsche, and getting out there going for a drive. Even if you're by yourself and you don't meet up with anybody and you go grab some lunch or you go grab a beer or whatever you want to go do, or just cruise around, go get some gas, and then... You know, or or meet up with some friends. You know, like one of my favorite things. You know, we have a lot of events. Aaron and I are going to be going to coming up this year, um, and one of the bigger ones we're going to be driving down to Miami, which is about a four and a half hour drive from us. That's a good drive. Yeah, and we're all going to cruise Long down drive. together as a pack. 
and I'm super excited about that. I'm excited about the event, don't get me wrong, but I'm really excited about the drive because I love that. I love it when, you know, a pack of us get together and we all go together because I can see his car and he can see my car and we're all rolling and and it goes back to what we talked about in our first episode, why we love Ren Sports so much about you see the cars in motion. You know, static displays are great, but when you can see these beautiful works of art in motion, smell them, hear them, you know, it's a sensory overload, right? Like it gives another sense of emotion on, yeah. on how the cars are meant to be used. And mm-hmm. yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, thanks for the questions, guys. Um, that's about our time right now. Um, great episode. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Yep, that was good. See you guys later. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of PCAR Talk. Connect with us on Instagram at PCAR Talk or online at pcartalk.com.